Now what you're hearing today is a 20th century, I would say, spin on what's happened in the 7th century. He did say, and I think you, I hope you picked it up, that many of the exegetes, the original or the primary exegetes, those are not exegetes, excuse me, the compilers of the traditions, and they are compilers, and when you look at the compilers of the tradition, you will see that many of them were writing in the 9th and 10th century, not in the 20th and the 21st century. And he would say that they atomized their material and they just basically looked and they tried to find scripture to support what they were doing at that time. The difficulty is that in history you always take that material that is closest to the event. And in order to understand what you have just done with Surah 9.5 and Surah 2, Ayah 190, and also uh, Surah 22, Ayah 39 to 40, which are all well-known references, I would have not gone to Surah 9.5. I know a lot of people like to. It's not my sword verse. I have a much better one. I'll show it to you in just a while. But when you look at these verses and you start unpacking them, you need to go to other sources than uh, men like you have used, than Shibli Amani, who is much more of a modern scholar. You need to go back to people from that time. You need to go back to Ibn Hisham. You need to go back to Ibn Isak. You need to go back to others like Al-Buhari, Sahih Muslim, Ibn Dawud. You need to go back to uh, al tabari You need to go back to those people that were compiling what happened. In fact, they're the first people to compile what happened. You don't have anything earlier than that in any documented form. Ibn Hisham, who died in 833, Muhammad died in 632. That's within 200 years you have the first real biography of the Prophet's life. You need to go back to what he said was happening at that time. And when you go back to that time, when you go back to the, the, uh, the battles of Badr, and the Battle of Uhud, and the Battle of the Trenches, 624, 625, 627, when you go to the Battle of Badr, you say that they were attacked. Who was attacking who? Because when you read what Ibn Isak says, and when you read what Ibn Hisham said, who was his student, and al waqidi says, who was also his student, who, did, who wrote, who died in 835, what they were saying at that battle had nothing to do with them being, or defending what the Meccans were doing. Actually, the Meccans were on a caravan coming from Gaza back down to Mecca, and as they were passing across the plain of Badr, it was Muhammad that actually attacked them. Not defense whatsoever. They knew that this attack was going to go happen, and so they went and they asked for reinforcements, knowing that they were going to be attacked, interestingly, during the month of Ramadan, the month of peace. So the question you need to ask is, if they did initiate that attack, and remember Muhammad went to the Battle of Badr, which you're right, is, it, it, is a, it is a suburb, you might say, it's not too far away from Medina. When Muhammad went to the Battle of Badr in 624 with around 300 of his men, he was surprised to find there was a thousand there. He won that battle and he came back victorious, claiming that this was God's battle. It was God, it was God and the angels that were provided by God that won that battle for him. But then what would you expect the Meccans to do if they had been usurped? What would you do in that context? I know what I would do as a Christian. As a Christian, we're not permitted to use weapons. But these were not Christians at this time. Well, uh, Jay, I think, has a right to be angry because uh, the way he sees it is that I have hidden and covered up certain obvious things that should have been mentioned in my uh, initial presentation. Uh, but I think he's mistaken in that I did not deliberately overlook anything. Uh, the initial presentation um, was used up in uh, pulling together all of the verses of the Quran that relate to our subject as much as that would be possible within the time frame, frame that I was given, but also to lay out the interpretive framework that will help us to understand any verse of the Quran. I've stressed the intertextual and the contextual readings that the Quran must be subjected to. So I wasn't hiding anything. At the same time, uh, Jay thinks that uh, I should have referred to the seer of Ibn Ishaq, Ibn Ishaq in the recension of Ibn Hisham, which he says, uh, uh, whom he says died 200 years after the Prophet Muhammad. So he thinks that we ought to rely on writings which were written close to 200 years after the death of the Prophet Muhammad in order to understand Muhammad best. But what I've done instead is I've followed the scholarly discourse which says that the Quran is the most authentic document we have concerning the life and teachings of the Prophet Muhammad. And the Sirah and Maghazi works, which were written a couple of years, a hundred years after him, are not so reliable. So if we want to understand who Muhammad is, we do not interpret the Quran in the light of the Sirah, but we interpret the Sirah and the Maghazi works in the light of the Quran. And particularly, we can note, for example, this is not my own spin and rereading of it in the 20th century. We have a writing here from Lloyd Ridgeon in a book uh, entitled War and Peace 
Hadith and the world's religions. Writing on Islam, Rijan tells us, therefore the Maghazi literature provided the Muslims with a myth of unity and expansion reflecting the aims of the new dynasty, the Abbasids. This had to do with the political milieu in which they lived, precisely the things that I've emphasized in my previous presentation. So I wasn't hiding anything. Moreover, I'm not defending Muslims here tonight. I admit that uh, Muslims have done some horrible things and people of other faiths too have done some horrible things in history. But I was speaking about the teachings of the Quran in particular. Is the Quran a book about peace? And I think that I've established that very clearly with the evidence that I've called within the interpretive framework that I've given. Jay did not follow that interpretive framework. In fact, Jay, I think you have contradicted yourself here tonight based on what you have presented elsewhere. Because elsewhere and in other talks, Jay argues that the Sira and Maghazi and Hadith literature are not dependable because they're written so late. And tonight, he wants us to believe that they are dependable because they paint Muhammad as a violent individual. But I'm putting before you that the Quran, the earliest document about the Prophet Muhammad, shows him to not be a violent what individual. What about uh, the Battle of Badr? Was this uh, an offensive uh, uh, launched by the Muslims to attack a caravan? Here too, Shibla Mumani, in his book, The Seerah of the, of the Messenger of God, uh, analyzes the passages in the Seerah works and their relationship to the Quran, and he shows that the Quranic evidence bears testimony that the Muslims at the time of leaving their city thought that they were going to face the enemy who was going to attack them in a large number. Whereas the Maghazi works say that the Prophet Muhammad and his followers left their city to attack the caravan and it was when they were outside of the city that they got news that a large army is coming to defend the caravan and then they had to decide what they're going to do whether to turn back or to face the enemy whereas the Quran itself in Surah 8 shows that the Muslims in verse number 7 before leaving Medina already had to decide are they going to go face this overwhelming odds uh, or, or, or not so he shows that there's a great discrepancy what's to be trusted in the case of this discrepancy is the Quran over and above the Maghazi literature. So, in, uh, I don't believe that there's anything that Jay has said that overturns my initial presentation. I agree that he has a right to be angry because he, he understood that I was hiding something uh, and that could make somebody really angry. But um, folks, uh, I, I wasn't uh, hiding anything.